Good morning. Welcome to Disciple One, our Sunday morning class. This week we're on the fourth lesson of the New Testament, uh, Life Giver, in the study of uh, John's Gospel. So if you have your workbook, turn with me to page 32. Welcome to everybody in the class as well. And let's read together our theme verse from John chapter 10, verse 10. I came so that they could have life, indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. In our human condition, I'll read that for us. Most of the time, life seems meaningless. What's the point in living? I try to get close to others, but often I feel cut off. How can I live a happy, productive life at peace with myself and others? I want more than religion or religious ceremony. I want to experience God as a living presence in my life. I want to live with spiritual power. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful for John and the voice that he brought to us and the way that he transformed community and helped us understand what the church was supposed to look like and what we were supposed to look like as Christians. Lord, throughout history, we have gravitated to John's gospel for, for meaning, for doctrine, for dogma, to figure out just exactly who Jesus was and is and will forever be. Be with us, Lord, as we lean into these lessons and help us to understand the magnitude of what John's voice is bringing to our community of faith. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, John, we're studying Jesus in the Gospels on Tuesday mornings, and we're looking at very intently, we're going 32 weeks studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we really see that Matthew, Mark, and Luke have lots of similarities. That's why they're called synoptic gospels. But John, he's out in left field somewhere. He's, he's kind of his own man <laughs> doing his own thing. Even um, the, the chronic chronological order of Jesus' ministry doesn't fit Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He has Jesus going to Jerusalem very early in his ministry, where the other three have um, Jesus going at the last week of his life. <clears throat> so it's different. It's very different, and I think it's different for a reason. You know, we've said that everybody had their own audience. Uh, Mark was the first so he was out there for everybody. Matthew's audience was the Jew. Luke's audience was the Gentile. John's audience, I believe, is an audience that he felt needed correction, needed definition. There were a lot of, a lot of things happening that just didn't seem to, to fit. And people were misunderstanding things and some um, pretty major uh, heresies had popped up in the church. And there's a lot of heresies um, that came about in the first and second and third century. Uh, the very first book that I had to read in seminary uh, was, I forget the name, um, but it was about heresies and it was spelling out all of the heresy. So we started with, in seminary, here's all the things we're, we've done wrong. <laughs> and, and then we'll go to the things that we have done right. Well, I think John was a big part of correcting some of those odd heresies that popped up. And I can understand why they popped up. But let's talk about John himself. John, traditional hold, tradition holds, that he was John, the brother of James, one of the disciples of Jesus. He refers to himself 
as we're reading the gospel, the one who Jesus loved. When, when you read that in John, he's talking about himself. And uh, the tradition is that he lived to an old age. He was on the verge of being martyred when um, the emperor felt like it would do uh, more harm to kill him. So they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. And that's where he lived out the rest of his life to old age. Now this tradition of what I just explained to you did not appear until 180 AD. That's when um, one of our church fathers by the name of Irenaeus uh, wrote about John and wrote about this tradition. So it's credible and sounds good. There's one little bitty hiccup, though, that scholars have with this tradition is that the major church people, the bishop, Bishop Polycarp, who was martyred in the early church, Justin Martyr, Ignatius of Antioch, these are three major leading church leaders in around the time that John would have been exiled and would have been issuing, you know, his letters. and Because we believe John wrote the gospel, first, second, and third letter of John and the book of Revelation. So if he had indeed been writing to that magnitude, you would think that Bishop Polycarp, Justin Martyr, and Ignatius of Antioch would have mentioned him. There's no mention of John. There is mention of Paul. Paul wrote a bunch of letters, so those three guys mention Paul a lot. And there is the mention of John the Elder, which is a different person than John the Disciple. So, and you know, as you're reading through John, and as you get to uh, Revelation, he refers to himself sometimes as John the Elder. So that's a curious, um, that's a curious thing that happens. But I'm not here to develop any new heresies. <laughs> I'm here to simply say it's a bit odd. Is there anything out there that says that John the Elder is not John the Disciple? No, there's really nothing that is definitive on that. We just picked up on that. And the fact that those three guys mentioned John the Elder, and they're not talking about John the Disciple. And I would think if one of the disciples wasn't martyred and lived to an old age in exile, that we would have been talking about him and trying to get him out, or I don't know. Just It just, this is just one of those things that live in, Tradition and history. Yeah, especially with him being one of the original, you know, yes. early twelve. I mean, then, but could it? Have, it may have been out of fear that there was any. Could have been anything. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just hard to be speculating. It could have been anything, but Ignatius of Antioch was right there yeah. at the Isle of Patmos. I mean, it was just off the coast. So, I just don't quite understand yeah. why the Christian historians and church fathers didn't mention. John at that time and it was not until 180 so 80 years later Irenaeus says that this is who wrote this gospel and it really is more or less for admission into the canonization process that's why Irenaeus is, is saying this this is a book that we need to keep but anyway there could have been any kind of um Stuff going. It could have been John, we believe, wrote the book of Revelation, and uh, many scholars, not everybody, but many scholars believe the book of Revelation is historical rather than futuristic. And if it was historical, then there was a heck of a lot going on that threatened the lives of Christians. And so they may have kept it hush during that turn of that first century. Who knows? What we do know 
is that John's gospel is written to correct a few wrongs, um, a few of these heresies. Uh, matter of fact, I have written down that I believe the two major things that were going on and the reason John's gospel is important. Uh, one of the major heresies that was going on at the time of his gospel, and we can say 90 to 95 AD, was docetism. And docetism is a word in Greek that means to seem, to seem like. So what, what was kind of rumbling around the um, masses of, of Christian movement was that if Jesus is truly God, then Jesus only seemed like he was human. You see the difference? That he only appeared. In other words, he was faking his humanity. If he was God, he was faking it. And that became a pretty big deal in the Christian movement. Basically, you have this mindset that you can't kill God. So it just appeared like he died on the cross. It appeared like he was decaying in the cave or the tomb. It appeared like he was resurrected from the dead. And you see how that becomes... Very problematic for us. So John, in his gospel, goes to great extremes. And if you, if you look at the, the different ways that he talks about it, it becomes evident. He goes to great extremes to show Jesus' humanity and that he was a human being. He got mad in the temple turned over the tables, threw things. I'm sure he had some choice words. You know, that, that John wanted people to know Jesus was a guy. He was a man. He was, he was God, but he was human. And so he really did die. And he really did decay. Not, you know, he, he had a new body. He, that old body disappeared at, at the resurrection. But at any rate, what, what, John's, perp one of his major purposes is dealing with the problem of Jesus's humanity. And then the other major problem was <clears throat> the lifestyle that was being um, accepted and reported as the new way of living as a Christian. Christians introduced a new term called eternal life. But it doesn't have to do with anything concerning the quantity of life. Eternal life for Christians in the first century meant the quality of one's life. And by quality, they were saying, we can do anything we want to. We are above sin and the world. In other words, we don't even have to worry about sin anymore. Because as Christians, it doesn't apply to us. Sin doesn't apply to us. Our human life doesn't apply to us. We can eat anything we want to. We can sleep with whoever we want to. We can live it up and party. And, and it doesn't matter. Because once we're in this way, a Christian way, um, we're above life. And, and, of course, we know um, that's not right. So John was very determined to try to set us three, set us uh, right. And um, there, there was a group of people within the Christian, Christian movement, movement called Libertarians. And they really did believe, you know, that it don't matter. You can go do whatever you want to. You're above it all. It's a nice thought, but it's not right. And so John set out to do that. When you think about John's birth narrative or the story of Jesus' incarnation, in the beginning was God. 
and and he talks about um, Jesus being there as the logos, the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He doesn't go into all of this in Bethlehem and the time of, you know, it, it's not about that at all. It's about who Jesus was from the beginning. He was God. He came into this earth and we rejected him. So a, a lot of language in John's gospel about Jesus' identity and the Trinity trying to put our arms around the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, which, which I think is still a very hard thing to embrace. Um, when I take kids on profess, to the profess retreat, even after they've been raised in the church, and even after they've gone to power hour and studied and did all the curriculum that we've picked out, it's still in their vocabulary, in their mind, that God is the four-star general. And Jesus is the um, lieutenant. And the Holy Spirit is the foot soldier or the sergeant. It's a, it's a pecking order. And we still have that mindset, even in the church, it's hard for us to get around because Jesus prays to his Father in heaven. And it seems like God the Father holds all the power, right? Well, the military analogy you made is not a bad one. You think about it, the way it kind of works. You, know, you don't really see generals typically. They send out, <laughs> yeah, right. they out and they just drop it down to the enlisted yes. men to actually do the work. So it's, it's it's not a bad analogy, and it's why we gravitate to it, I think. Yeah. But it's not it's not the way it is. It it the Father and I are one, yeah. is what Jesus said. If you know me, Jesus said, you know the Father. I think all of that language has to do with a couple things. I, I think it's Jesus' way of sharing with us human beings a picture that we can embrace, first of all, a picture of a family. Not that families are all that they're supposed to be. I mean, um, I had one couple in a study we did on the uh, Ten Commandments, when we got to honor your father and mother, he spoke up and he said, I can't. And it was because of the way he was treated by his father. And he just said, I can't do it. If this is what is required of a Christian, I, I have to step away. I cannot honor my father and mother. So, <clears throat> I don't think Jesus gave us that image for us to apply it to our fathers. I think it was given to us as an image of humanity that we could understand. Now, what do you think I mean by that? It's really all we've got, isn't it? Um, procreation and how babies are born and <laughs> what parents look like and what parents do for their children. I mean, so just like the military example, Ken, is not quite appropriate, this father-son relationship is not quite appropriate either. I think that's why John had to, had to address that and say, Jesus is not a second lieutenant and the, and the uh, Holy Spirit is not our sergeant. They're all the same. They are different manifestations of God, but it's not three gods. We still get accused of that heresy with Islam and Hebrew people. You're worshiping three gods and we're a 
monotheistic God, a worship of a monotheistic God. So that can't be. But what we're really saying is that God um, manifests God's self in certain ways for certain uh, actions. And it also talks, I think, I think the Trinity also speaks of God's ability to really be everywhere, to be omnipresent. It, it, God can be listening to the prayers of someone in China as well as God is listening to the prayers of someone in Advance. It's that omnipresent nature of God. And for us, John helped us tremendously by this language of the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then this image of Jesus rising at the Ascension and the Holy Spirit coming <clears throat> down at Pentecost. John's Gospel could be called the Gospel of the Holy Spirit as well because he emphasizes that tremendously. Is that like part of him? He's yes. the God of the Holy Spirit? I, I think it could be called that. The Gospel of the Holy Spirit. That John's Gospel yeah. could be called the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. How do y'all struggle with the Trinity? Or do you? Maybe you don't. I mean, maybe you... My story is exactly how you just described being a little kid's coming out of the power of uh -huh. what I thought about growing up. Yes. Um, and then when I started to develop my version of a spiritual relationship, I felt like I was talking to the same person. But when I was little, it was very much... It was very much... And the Holy Spirit didn't really exist as a you know, high school kid. Right. It's not how I thought about it. Right. I will say, you know, backgrounds all different, but mother was Catholic, and then we started going to a, a we'll call it community church. So, mm -hmm. Catholic background. Yes. Very. A little different. Don't ask. Right. Don't, <laughs> don't look for the answer. Just listen to so it. There's no real, <laughs> so there's no relationship. Right. So it was father, son, no Holy Spirit. That's how I was mm. fed. And then, uh, then the Holy Spirit, as I said, dear relationship. Right. It felt like one. Right. I, I, I think one of the things that I struggle with, even to this day, is the, the way we posture ourselves with prayer. <clears throat> if indeed... We have the Holy Spirit living in us. We really don't need to pray to anyone, do we? We just need to <coughs> embrace that relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. God hears our prayers through our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And yet, we pray our prayers to God <coughs> in Jesus' name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we do that so that we can bridge the gap between us and the Father so that Jesus is bridging that gap to God the Creator and Father. So that in and of itself makes me think there's got to be a pecking order here. There's got to be <laughs> there's got to be some significance to God the Creator that doesn't exist in God the Son. Or God the Holy Spirit, because I'm asked to pray. Jesus, this is how you pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Why wouldn't he say, when I get up there, say, hallowed be y'all's name? <laughs> in my southern English. Yes, yes. Lord's Prayer and but towards Caesar. Right. How, how would that be articulated? Yes. It would be different, wouldn't it? Except if you have a good, sound, Trinitarian 
theology. And then I say good and sound, it's still a bit, um, it's one of those things that you just have to almost, like Catholicism, say, don't ask a lot of questions about this. This is not for you to know. But pray like this. And Jesus is our intercessor. I mean, that's what I teach. But I do believe as powerful as it is to pray to God the Father through Jesus the Son, the power of the Holy Spirit is something that we seldom even acknowledge. Even in our um, liturgical work. The church of the work of the church, the things that we say in the church. Yes. But I, yeah, I generally would not pray in Jesus' name, but there is the tradition of in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right, exactly. Some thought of prayers have that. That's exactly right, Joel. Yeah. The, the professor that I had for Christian Theology 101 at Duke said, God's name is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's God's name. So if we're going to pray to God, we should probably say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. You're a very good point. Because I do believe we can get into giving certain manifestations of God and certain nuances of God. Um, and what, what I think John is trying to create is this idea that in the beginning was God and the Word, and the Word was Jesus, and the Word was there when everything was created. Jesus wasn't created. The Holy Spirit was never given birth. But this whole birth into humanity is what messes with us. I would go so far as to say there are some Christians who believe that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And that's when Jesus the Son became. And so that's how the whole, um, that's the problem that we have. That's the problem of docetism. Um, it, it's, it's even the way we try to work things out becomes problematic. <laughs> well, he really wasn't a human being. He just appeared to be a human being. He didn't really die on the cross. He, he didn't really get, he didn't die at all. He didn't get resurrected. And so if the resurrection is taken out of our story, boy oh boy, we're in trouble, right? So that didn't work. Let's read, let's read um, what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in particular. Um, John 16. He does an awful lot. John does the most, by the way, with um, the Holy Spirit, as I said, than anybody else. And he does more at the end of his life than in any of the other Gospels. We call this the farewell discourse. And it starts... Um, it, I think it really starts at chapter 13 where he's washing the feet and he starts talking about the Holy Spirit and all and he spends several chapters where Matthew, Mark, and Luke you know a chapter or two at the most so this farewell discourse in John's gospel is lengthy and we're reading about in the middle of it look at John 16 uh, starting <coughs> at verse 5. I'll read this for us today, 5 through 14. Listen to what it says and think about what it says about God the Spirit. And Jesus said, I didn't say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. 
it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Isn't that a pecking order sentence? God the Father sent me. I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. So it's a, I see why we get that. That, uh, okay. <laughs> and when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And that the Father has, all that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. <laughs> that sounded like he wrote a sentence and then he said, no, I need to add to that. <laughs> what does that say about God? What does that say about the Trinity in that particular passage of Scripture? He's got to go away so the advocate or the spirit can come. But <coughs> that just implies by that statement that the second to me that mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, it make it just seems that even though they're you know, I mean I guess I'm just always using But separate in purpose. Right. Are you yeah, saying separate in entity? Because how can an entity mm -hmm. abide in all of us and be and not be a bunch of separate entities. And maybe it's lost in the, right, in the writing, you know, that the way John describes it, but he does it in chapter 5. I was looking at that earlier where, where Jesus says, God doesn't judge. He leaves the judgment to the Son. Yeah. You know, which separates them, right? And, and he mentions many times that if you know me, you know the Father, which makes them distinctions. Yes. So the birth, they're both judging. Well, he says it too that the Spirit will not speak on its own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will go on to declare to you the things that are come. So it, that, it almost sounds like the Spirit doesn't know until the Father tells it. Mm. I mean, it, much of this implies your pecking order here. I think so too. But I, 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 I just want to tell you that the church says that's heresy. <laughs> so when I get the kids on the professor retreat, I tell them, that's not right. <laughs> God's name is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the best way. And, and you know, I've heard some, <clears throat> excuse me, I've heard some pastors talk about ice. You know, that ice is water. But when it's frozen, it's a cube of ice or a chunk of ice. And when you put it in certain elements, it will, it will evaporate and flow into the air. So just like the simplicity of saying ice, is, ice can take three different forms, water can take three different forms, God can take three different forms, yet it's the same essence. It's the same... It's a big mystery is what it is. <laughs> it's a mystery that we probably will never work out this side of heaven. But it's interesting, I believe, um, to, to look at and to think about the ways we try to work it out. Think about that. Think about the ways we try to work that out. And how, you know, what is, what is John's human 
word that's coming through this. Even even the statement of um, he's coming, the Holy Spirit, the advocate is coming to help you because you are mine. Now the Father and I are the same, so you're his too. <laughs> but you're really mine. It's, it's that language, isn't it? That it's almost like Jesus is making sure that the disciples understand you're mine. You are the sheep that hear my voice and you come and you know me. Um, and, and you will know the Spirit as well. It's an interesting thing. What, what, let's, let's back up before we get too enthralled in that. What does the Spirit do for us? What does this passage say the Spirit does? For, you, you said it a while ago, Ken. You said that um, he's, the Spirit is present here and speaks about the future, right? Yes, speaks about the future. What does that mean to you? If the Holy Spirit lives in you and speaks about the future in you, what does that mean? What does that really do for us? Pastor again. If the Holy Spirit of God abides in us, and speaks about the future to us, in us, what does that mean? Well, I would say it's like the, the guidance from our decisions that we make. Exactly. I think same thing. God can find the Spirit on as a path. He can to do the right thing. That doesn't mean we listen very well sometimes, but I think that's what he's trying to do. I don't interpret that that he means we're all prophets. No, I don't either. I, I think <clears throat> he's trying to guide us to just do the right thing. <clears throat> and how does that make you feel? I'm talking about an emotional, physical, human attribute. How does it make you feel to know that God is living inside of you, telling you what to do in the future? Steering you along the path, warning you about. Have you ever felt that, by the way? Have you ever just. I don't believe. Here's what I think we do <laughs> as human beings. We, unless we're living in the Spirit, we have a tough time discerning what is our conscience versus what is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not your conscience. The Holy Spirit is not your mama telling you, if you touch that stove, you're going to get burned. And so within your makeup, you understand that's bad for you. And I, I say the same thing about sin. The Holy Spirit will guide us away from sin that we don't know is sin. Because there are things we don't know about spiritual maturity, spiritual perfection, the righteousness of God, the purposes of God. Well, let me let, me let you in. We're losing time here, so let me let you in on what I'm talking about. I believe that is the gift of assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, promise of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. That's what Fanny Crosby was trying to talk about, that the gift of assurance. My mama used to say, I can't tell you, but I know that I know. <laughs> I can't tell you where it even comes from, but I know that I know. And, and so when people come to me and say, I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven, I would say to them, lean into the Holy Spirit with everything you've got. Because that Holy Spirit is in you and is alive and well and wants you to know what the future looks like. It's a fortune teller. <laughs> And, and the way I believe the Holy Spirit works in our 
quirky humanity is basically the Holy Spirit has to say, hmm, something just don't feel right to me about going that route. I was supposed to go that way, be that person, do that job, marry that girl. <laughs> Will the Holy Spirit set you up? I don't know. But I know this, the Holy Spirit. What, what else does he say? The Holy Spirit teaches us, convicts us, bears witness. I often tell people, folks will say to me, Pastor, if I go serve soup on a soup trailer, I don't know what to say to those people. Well, you don't have to worry about it. The Holy Spirit is with you, and the, they're going to see God in you. I have this w wonderful uh, tool that I hate to really disclose, but it's a good one. When I come up to people, I come up to Scott Barney and I say, Scott, I need you to be the chairperson of the PPR team because I see Jesus in you. Boy, you talk about hard to say no. <laughs> <laughs> God says it's hard to say no when the preacher comes up to you and says, I see Jesus in you. There's, there's no no. <laughs> there is a no. There is a no. But I, I think the Spirit does bear witness. I see it in every one of you. I mean, it's, there's no question in my mind. So um, the Holy Spirit will also, what, what does the Bible also say? The Holy Spirit, when we don't know how to pray and when the words just don't, the Holy Spirit will intercede for us in prayer. Now, you, you may not have ever had that happen in your life, but I think especially when we're uh, weak in our humanity, when we're sick, when we can't, audibly even say anything listen i believe the holy spirit is there and doing the holy spirit's thing i think that's why jesus said it's better for me because as a human being having flesh and blood he could only make his way to certain places right he, could, he was in galilee for a while he, Walked down the Jordan, Jericho, Jerusalem, three years. That's not a very long time. I would have liked to have walked with him, wouldn't you? I mean, I, I, think, I think that would have been just uh, a perfect life. But yet, um, Jesus says, it's going to be better for you that I leave. Because I, what I'm sending you is not a diminished version of me. It's not a watered-down Jesus. Um, God. It's not a, it's not a watered-down presence of God. So we, we pray. And the language that I was taught growing up, too, is that uh, the Creator God, the Redeemer God, and the Sustainer God. Do any of y'all have that? God the Creator is God the Father. He did all the, um, you know, here's the earth, here's the <clears throat> seas. And then Jesus redeems us. That was his purpose of manifestation. And then the sustainer, God, lives in us. It's that Jeremiah covenant. You'll know me. There won't have to be any law. You won't have to memorize the 687 commandments. They're going to be written on your heart. And you'll know them and you'll know me. Do you feel like you know people who are Christian spirit-filled people when you meet them? Yeah, even first even when impression. you it, it, could it be a first impression, Ken? I, I, I'm not really thinking about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Because human impression is also a part of the equation, isn't it? It could simply be that you like the person you meet and you want them to be a Christian, so you're going to impose that Holy Spirit on them just because you they look like you, they smell like you, maybe you're attracted to them. You know, I don't know. <laughs> but our human nature gets in the way a lot of times. And I believe God does something very unique in this spirit-filled life is God gives us humans the ability to quench that spirit or to suppress that spirit. I call it stiff arm from football. You stiff arm them and the Holy Spirit sits over in the corner while you do what you want to do. I don't know why God allows that, but it doesn't work out well. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work out well when we, when we do that. That will catch up with us, right? But the fact that God even allows it. I feel so strongly about this spirit-filled nature of God that I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to question sometime what really is our purpose. Because if we find God and we experience all that God shared with us that we would experience it to the magnitude and to the abundance that Jesus said, beam me on up. Why, why stay here? And, and Paul even said that in his letters. It, it's better to be in heaven. Do you all realize that? It's a much better place than we have here. And it is a place. If we, if we embrace um, God and, and Jesus' teachings and the Holy Spirit's leaning, leading, why don't we just go ahead and get beamed on up? Anybody got an answer for that? Still got work to do. <laughs> I think you still got work to do. Absolutely. I think there's still babies to be made. <laughs> I think there's still, you know, some people believe that, I think this is a Catholic thing, that there are so many souls in this, wherever souls are kept before they're given life, and that that has to be. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a Catholicism thing, I believe, although I've never been Catholic. Huh? A, limited a limited number, and once it, once it has been emptied, then Jesus returns. I've, I've seen that as an understanding of that, but I don't know. I guess I never thought about putting limits on God. Well, I know. I don't know that it's a limit on God, but it might be a limit on us. It might be that, yeah. I mean, we're certainly limited years, aren't we? Well, yeah. yeah. And the earth, if we keep doing what we're doing to it, it's going to run out of yeah. its limit. You know, you always read those bumper stickers that people have. <laughs> and I saw one this week that just simply said, the earth was doing quite well without us. <laughs> All right, well, let's read our, um, you know, every lesson comes with a mark of discipleship. And this lesson on 38 ends with this mark of discipleship, which, which is what I was trying to get to when we were talking about what does the Holy Spirit do. Disciples experience life in Jesus Christ and have the inner assurance, the knowledge of the future, and of abundant eternal life. And I do agree with even the, even the docetism that was going around during uh, John's day that eternal life begins with our embracing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It's not something that happens when we die. I believe it truly is a quality of life. And we tend to put a quantity number on it, like 
it's just forever. But the real issue is the quality of life that begins when we accept Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's pray. God, we are grateful for your love. We are grateful for the way that you inhabit us and the way you lead us and prompt us into praise. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you have shared with us and the way in which we struggle to be faithful in our discipleship. Lord, we pray that you would use us to witness and to be a witness through the Spirit that lives in us for the world to see and to know who we belong to and what we profess. We pray today for those 28,000 people who have lost their lives in Turkey and Syria, the families that are grieving and the crisis that is right at hand. We ask, Lord, for your comfort and your presence and your witness to be displayed in such a time as this. We pray this prayer this morning in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All righty. Have a good week, and we will see you uh, next week online and in class. Have a great one.